I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die um, Good evening, my name is Tucker Hyatt I'm the founding director of Wonderfest, and I'm on the board of the Bay Board of Directors of the Bay Area Skeptics. Welcome to a Dural Biotech. I am not, unfortunately, an employee of a Dural Biotech, but it's sure very nice to be here. And I'm very grateful to a Duro and their, the heart of their, or at least the feet of much of their effort. Uh, Janae Reynolds, Al Janae Reynolds was here just moments ago. She may come back later. She's at work besides helping us run this event. So, Thank you for being here. Thank you to how many of you are Bay Area Skeptics fans or even members? Raise those hands tall. Come on, you're proud. All right. How many of you know about this event through Wonderfest? Ah, oh, that's so many. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Mary Lugodu is a graduate student in the psychology department of UC Berkeley, where she focuses on cognitive development. How appropriate for tonight. The goal of Mariel's research is to understand the cognitive precursors to scientific thinking. In particular, Mariel is asking, how do young children learn to reason about cause and effect? She pursues such questions primarily through empirical research with toddlers and preschoolers, but she also integrates vision science and theoretical perspectives from philosophy. Mariel was nominated for the Science Envoy program by UC Berkeley psychologist and former Wonderfest and Bay Area Skeptic speaker, Allison Gottnick. Please welcome Mariel Godou. Thank you. Hi there. Um, so my name is Mariel, um, and like Tucker said, I'm a PhD student in psychology at UC Berkeley and the Wonderfest Science Envoy. Um, I was asked to provide something of an opening act um, for our real speaker today, Dr. Tanya Lombroso, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, so I decided that in order to um, warm you all up, to get you ready um, for this talk about the human drive to explain, uh, that we were going to play a little explanatory game. Do you guys think you've been playing an explanatory game? That's not going to be hard. You don't have to do a lot of talking. What you do need to have, though, is two hands. If you can put your two hands up like this. Um, so this is a little game called I-O-E-D, and I'm going to tell you what that stands for at the end of the game. Um, but the I-O-E-D is a game about explanation, um, and in order to play, we're going to be making some ratings about our own kind of ability to explain. So right now, um, on a scale of one being, I'm really, really bad at giving explanations, and five being like, eh, I'm okay at giving explanations, and ten being like, I'm awesome at giving explanations. Can everyone please just like, give themselves a generous, a general, and it could be generous rating of uh, how well you think you can explain stuff. On a good day. <laughs> okay, we got some pretty good explainers here. I see some eights, I see some sevens. Okay, okay, great. So now we're going to try this for a couple of um, specific topics. So keep your hands ready, because we're going to need them. Um, on a scale of one to ten, how well do you think you could explain how a ballpoint pen works? How does a ballpoint pen work? You don't have to say it out loud, you just need to, how well could you explain that to somebody? Oh, okay, okay, so you can seven, eight, all right, we're good explainers. Okay, here's another one. How well could you explain, on a scale of one to 10, how piano keys make sounds? Okay, we're doing pretty good. So five, some seven, some, some eight, so wow, okay, great. Um, how about on a scale of one to ten, how well could you explain how a flush toilet works? Alright. Okay, we're doing we're doing pretty well. Okay, uh, and last one, how well do you think you could explain how a can opener works? Could you please raise yourselves on a scale of one to ten? Okay. So everybody remember, look at your hands, remember how many fingers you're holding up. And now I would like you to uh, turn and introduce yourself to the person sitting next to you and explain how a can opener works. You have 30 seconds. <laughs> you just have 15 seconds. And okay, you can wrap up your explanations and get your fingers right again. 
All right, so based on that exercise, um, who would like to re-rate how well they can actually explain how Canada works? And would you, in fact, put up your hands again and read with their new rating of um, how good your explanation was? <laughs> all right, so I noticed, uh, being able to see all of you here, um, that there were some uh, decreases in uh, numbers of the fingers after that explanation exercise. Um, and this is known as the illusion of explanatory depth. This is a, um, a discovery or phenomenon that was first described by Leon Rosenblatt and Frank Pyle in a 2002 uh, paper titled The Illusion of Explanatory Depth. And the idea here is that um, we seem to have the illusion in a lot of cases that we can really explain um, we can explain certain kinds of phenomena, particularly sort of mechanistic phenomena, like we just sort of call it explanatory phenomena, like how a can opener works or how a flush toilet works. Um, we have this illusion that we think that we can explain much better than we actually do. Um, the solution is still present for other types of, um, you know, sort of procedural, uh, for example, uh, types of processes that is most pronounced for this sort of causal explainer. So it's just a fun, fun exercise in remembering uh, that we don't maybe really know that much, um, <laughs> or know as much as we think we do. Um, in any event, okay. So now that you're warmed up, I think you're ready to um, to. Meet Dr. Don Lombrosa, so it's my great pleasure this evening to introduce uh, my fellow UC Berkeley psychologist and um, collaborator, Dr. Tanya Lombrosa. Dr. Lombrosa is both uh, an associate professor of psychology and an affiliate of the Department of Philosophy at Berkeley. She directs the Concepts and Cognition Lab, where she and her students study aspects of human cognition uh, that lie sort of at the intersection of philosophy and psychology. This work includes research on the human drive to explain, as we'll hear about uh, this evening, and its relationship to understanding uh, various aspects of causal and moral reasoning and all kinds of learning. Um, so Dr. Lombrosa received her PhD in psychology from Harvard University in 2006. She has received an NSF Career Award, a McDonald Foundation Scholar Award in Understanding Human Cognition, and a Janet Taylor Spence Award for Transformational Early Career Contributions from the Association for Psychological Science. Um, in addition to her research, Dr. Lombrosa is a blogger for Psychology Today and also for NPR's Cosmos and Culture. Um, past blog post topics, I would highly encourage you to um, check out uh, Cosmos and Culture especially, include the dangers of hidden jargon in communicating science, the neurobiology of Father's Day cards, is education tied to conspiracy theory belief, a day in the life of an academic mom, and do you suffer from illusions of moral superiority? <laughs> Finally, Dr. Lombrosa has co-written an educational music video for teaching children about evolution. This is titled Five Violet Spiders. Um, also, I would highly recommend that you check that out. And in graduate, graduate school, Dr. Lombrosa is rumored to have written psychology-related songs, uh, set to fiddle on the roof, and invented several psychology-themed board games. So please, join me in welcoming the multifaceted Dr. Tommy Lombrosa. <laughs> Thank you so much for um, inviting me for this audience, and thank you, Meryl, for the lovely introduction. Oh, good, I have my slides. Um, so what I'm hoping to do today is to tell you a little bit about some of my research on explanation. Um, but really what um, I'm hoping is to get your questions and thoughts. This is an audience I'm especially excited to talk about, uh, to talk to, um, <laughs> given your interest in, in uh, skeptical thinking and the wonderful aspects of science. So um, as a starting point, I want to start with a definition that the biologist Stephen Jay Gould apparently gave for humans in a talk in 1997. And he defined humans as the primates who tell stories. <laughs> and a psychologist named Robin Dawes took this one step further. And he said that humans are the primates whose cognitive capacity shuts down in the absence of a story. And what Dawes had in mind here is the fact that if you give people lots of isolated statistical information or isolated facts or pieces of evidence, they're often not very good at using that to actually guide their behavior and to guide their decisions. It seems like often what we need is something like a causal story that puts those pieces together and tells us how one thing influenced another to bring something about. And when we have that causal story, we seem to get a sense of understanding. Um, and in fact, sometimes perhaps we find things more compelling than we ought to, just because they have this compelling form of a story or a narrative. 
And this is something that really you see across lots of domains, our fascination with causal stories or narratives. There's been a lot of evidence looking at this, and in fact, you do find that people find uh, compelling anecdotes, for example, very persuasive. Um, one context where you see this is, is politics. So for example, you can imagine somebody telling a compelling anecdote about a small business owner who went bankrupt after a tax policy, or someone whose life dramatically improved as a result of Obamacare, um, and compare the influence of that kind of a compelling story or anecdote to just giving people statistical evidence or some other uh, basis that might change their beliefs. And you do find that these are often as persuasive for people as the actual evidence itself. Another domain where you see this is in the legal system. Um, I have a PhD student um, named Carly Giffen who studies psychology and the law, and she likes to describe the legal system as competitive explaining. Right? You have the prosecution and the defense each trying to provide a story about what it is that happened, um, and people's judgments are often influenced by which was the better story about the defendant and what actually occurred. And I think you see this across actually quite a lot of other things. So in science, we're often oops, we're often science, we're often really after a good theory that gives us a good causal story about what happened. We're often not satisfied to just have a mere description, or, or even often good predictions. It seems like we want something more. We want something that gives us a real sense of understanding about a particular phenomenon. In history, we want a good narrative, not just a sequence of events about what happened and then what happened after that. Um, in many cases of religion, it seems like we want something that gives us a purposive explanation that explains why we're here in a way that we find meaningful and not perhaps as a mere accident. So I think despite the diversity across all of these examples, what you see that's common is that people are really driven to get some kind of a sense of understanding. And that sense of understanding seems to be related to the kinds of causal stories that we tell and receive. We seem to want answers to the question, why? And so what I'm hoping to do is to take that same impulse for explanation, that same impulse to ask why, um, and turn it on the phenomenon of explanation itself. Right? So why do we explain? How do we explain explanation itself? Um, and in particular, the question I want to focus on is, why are we so motivated to explain? Right? This seems like a compelling feature of the kinds of creatures that we are. Uh, why is it that we're so motivated to do this? And my approach in thinking about this question uh, is to sort of try to reverse engineer explanation, to think about what explanation does for us. Uh, and one way to motivate this way of thinking about it is to imagine that you're trying to program some kind of an artificial intelligence system that's capable of human levels of learning and human levels of reasoning. And you can ask yourself, if you had a system like that, would there be any role for explanation in that system? Would that system be motivated to explain? And why? What would it do for that creature? So if we think back to the kinds of creatures we are, we know that we're motivated to explain. We can think about what does that do for us? Might that play a really important role in what allows us to have particular human levels kinds of intelligence that allow us to learn the way that humans learn and so on? And there's a few different answers I think have been proposed in both philosophy and psychology and other kinds of literatures about what it is that explanation might do for us. And so let me tell you a couple um, before focusing on some research that looks at this question. Um, so one answer, is that the promise of explanations might motivate us to learn, right? So explanations have a particular kind of phenomenology or feeling associated with them. We typically find it very satisfying to get a good explanation. And so one idea is that that satisfaction that we get from explaining might motivate us to learn about the world. Um, and this idea was uh, put forth, I think, uh, most provocatively by my colleague, Alison Gopnik, who's been mentioned already, in a paper that she wrote called Explanation as Orgasm. And the analogy that she develops there is that explanation is to theory formation as orgasm is to reproduction, the phenomenological mark of the fulfillment of an evolutionarily determined drive. Right. So the idea is that uh, we might be tuned to engage in certain kinds of activities, like seeking explanations in the world, um, and we might do this in part because we find it satisfying to uh, find good explanations, but the very act of doing that is going to help us build good causal maps of the world and engage in the kind of theory formation which is going to make us more effective uh, learners and researchers and decision makers in the world. A related idea comes from philosophy, that seeking explanations might lead us to particularly useful hypotheses. Um, so one version of this is this uh, quote that I like from the philosopher Willard von Armin Quine um, and co-author. He writes that, the hypotheses we seek an explanation of past observations serve again in the prediction of future ones. And then my favorite part, curiosity thus has survival value despite having to look at it. So engaging in this kind of explanation seeking behavior is going to be the sort of thing that allows us to discover features of the world that are going to lead us to be more effective agents. 
So one of the things that I do uh, in my lab um, is take these sorts of ideas uh, seriously and then think about how we can test them and how we can refine them in a well-controlled laboratory context. Right? How can you take this incredibly messy and diverse real-world phenomenon of explanation seeking and then try to figure out what some of the underlying psychological mechanisms are that lead us to look for explanations the way they do and that maybe have a particular consequence on how it is that we learn. Um, so the, the question I focused on in the works that I'm going to tell you about today is the question of how it is that engaging in this process of seeking for explanations, right, sort of um, uh, following our drive to explain, how that might actually affect the process of learning and discovery. You know, is it the case that when we're looking for explanations, we actually look for information differently, we process information differently, we discover different features of our environment or use the information that we learn differently than if we were not trying to explain. And if so, that might give us some hints as to why explanation seems to be such a basic drive uh, for so many people, at least in so many contexts. So how do we take this into the lab and study it experimentally? Um, there's a variety of ways that one might do this, but one of the basic strategies that we've adopted that I'm going to tell you about today is to try to take an experimental approach. And what we do is that we bring people into the lab and randomly assign them to one of two groups. And in the experimental group, They'll be given some kind of a task, like learning new categories of objects, or trying to figure out the causal relationships in some new artificial world. We'll give them some information about uh, those categories, those causal relationships, and so on. And then we'll prompt them to explain as they're studying this. So we'll ask them, well, why do you think that one belongs to that category? Why do you think that event came about? Uh, and they'll generate explanations, and we don't give them any feedback. We don't tell them if those explanations are good or bad. We don't tell them if they're right or wrong. We just want them to be actively engaged in the project of seeking explanations. And what we do is that we compare what goes on in those conditions to a group of participants in a control condition. And the critical thing in the control condition is that everybody has the same goal, learning to classify these objects or trying to figure out causal relationships. They get the same information. And the only difference is that instead of telling them to explain as they study, we give them some sort of a control task. And in different experiments, we do different control tasks. But typically, we want them to be equally engaging. We also want them to be using language. So we might tell them to describe things, or we might tell them to think aloud as they're studying, and so on. And so we try to make these as similar as possible as we can. Um, now, we expect that to some extent, people might be just spontaneously explaining in that control condition. But the hope is that people are explaining more in the top condition than the bottom condition. So if we compare what goes on in these two cases, we can get a sense of how it is that engaging in the process of explaining is actually changing how people learn. Um, so if you imagine these two learners here, at time one and at time two, time one is before they engage in this uh, explaining or control task, and time two is afterwards, at time one, we'd expect them to be the same in terms of what they know about this task because they've been randomly assigned to these conditions. But if we find any differences at time two, we know that we can't just attribute those differences to something about the task they were given or the information they were given because that was the same across all of these cases. If we find differences at time two, it's going to tell us something about how this process of explaining affected the way that they use this information or accomplish this task. So that's the basic strategy that can hopefully give us some insight into how it is that explanation seeking actually changes the process of learning and discovery. So here we can have some audience participation. I want you to all pretend that you are participants in one of these experiments. Um, and if you were a, a participant in, in, in these experiments, typically you'd be introduced to some fictional world. This is Planet Zorg, because I want you to learn something that you don't already know. And so we're going to teach you about some categories on Planet Zorg. And so you might, depending on the experimental condition to which you're assigned, learn about these kinds of robots called Glorps and Drents. Or you might learn about these different types of containers that were found on this planet. These are Ordeeps and Andrax. Or you might learn about different types of flowers and so on. And so zooming in here on the robots for a moment, your task would be to learn how to classify uh, robots as being Drents or Glorps. Um, you'd be told that that's what your task is, because I'm later going to show you some new robots, and you're going to have to show up to tell me if they are glorps or dress. So that is what your task would be. Um, and you'd be given a few minutes to study examples like this. So hopefully you can see here there's eight examples that are labeled for you to study. Four of them are labeled as dress, and four of them are labeled as glorps. And you have not had as much time to stare at this as participants in my study. But does anybody notice anything that might help you classify glorps and drents? All of the glorps have some kind of pointed foot. Excellent. OK, straight for the subtle thing. OK, so all, um, the, the, the answer was that all of the glorps have some kind of a pointy foot at the bottom. 
Um, and that, that's exactly the sort of subtle rule that we built in here. But the way that we built these was to actually have two different kinds of patterns that you might pick up on. So first of all, I should say there's a lot going on here in terms of colors and so on. We tried to make it so that there's no real pattern related to the colors. Um, of course, it's always possible someone will find something that we didn't intend to be there. Um, so sometimes people do discover creative things, but it was intended not to have anything too meaningful related to colors. It was intended to have one uh, pattern that's relatively easy to spot. And that pattern is what I'm going to call the 75% pattern, which is that three out of the four dreads have round bodies, and three out of the four glorps have square bodies. But in each case, there's one exception. So this is a pattern which is relatively salient, but it also has this deficiency. There are these exceptions, and they seem like totally arbitrary exceptions. They don't seem like very meaningful exceptions. There's also this more subtle rule, which at least one person discovered, perhaps others did as well. So you'll notice that all of the foot shapes are different. Um, so if you were thinking about these as triangles versus T-shapes versus L-shapes, you probably wouldn't find much of a pattern at all. But if you think about it in a slightly more abstract way, in terms of whether or not the bottom is pointy or flat, you'll notice this pattern where all of the dreads have feet that are flat at the bottom, and all of the glorps have feet that are pointy at the bottom. And we call that the 100% pattern because it accounts for all eight of these examples, which has to do with pointy versus last feet. OK, these are kind of fun, so I'll give you one more example. <laughs> um, suppose you were learning to classify stomps and thumps. So here you have eight examples of stomps and eight examples of thumps. Um, in this case, does anybody notice anything that might help you classify them? Is that any hand in the back? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all the stomps have pointy pedals, and all the, oh, no. No, they don't. No. Ah, OK. But that is great that you notice that, because I think you're illustrating part of the process that people go through here, right? Which is that you pick up on a feature, and you think, maybe this is what's mm -hmm. going on. And then maybe you notice it works for most cases, but not others, right? And I think that's exactly what people go through in these cases when they're trying to figure out what the structure is here. Um, we have two hands here, yeah. The thumbs have double circles for the middle of the flower and the other in the Okay, box. all right, this audience is good. Usually, often, often I get blank stares. Okay, so again, the critical thing here is that there's two different patterns that we try to build in here. And again, we put in other things going on too because it shouldn't be an easy task. Um, the relatively salient thing you might have noticed is sort of solid versus multicolored. So the thing that might kind of pop out is that some of these are relatively solid pastel colors and some of them are really multicolored. Um, but there's an exception to that pattern. And we also have this slightly more subtle thing to pick up on, which is the number of circles in the center, whether it's a single circle or a double circle. And that I'm going to call the 100% pattern because it counts all cases. OK, so hopefully the structure here is clear. In each of these cases, there's something that's relatively obvious or easy to detect, but it's somehow imperfect. And there's something more subtle that requires kind of deeper digging and thinking about the structure of this category. But it's, it's better in the sense that it accounts for all cases. So here's what we do with these in the lab. Um, a participant would come in, they'd be introduced to this category, told that their task is to learn how to classify things into these two categories. They would then study them. And this is really the critical part. As they study them, half the people would be prompted to explain. So in a case like this, they would be, they'd be shown a, a particular robot and said, why do you think this one's a giant? Why do you think this one's a dwarf? Why do you think this one's a thon? Why do you think this one's a, a, a soft? And so on. And they would provide their explanations. And we've done this either they provide them verbally or they write them down. Uh, and again, they get no feedback on whether that's right, wrong, good, bad. And in the control condition, we have people do something else. So for the data I'm going to show you, um, we have people in the control condition either describe each of those items. We thought maybe that's a good way to make sure they're paying attention, looking at all the features, or think aloud while studying these. We thought that's a good way to make sure they're using language and engaging in the task, but we're not you know, sort of forcing them to do anything in particular, they're free to do whatever they want, or, or just engage in free study. Um, where they know what their task is, they have time to study, but we don't give them any additional tasks to do while they study. We then have them categorize a bunch of things as blurbs or trends, and we can see what their categorization behavior looks like. We also explicitly ask them, what do you think the differences are between the members of these two categories? And we can code what they tell us in terms of whether or not they discovered that foot pattern, or the body pattern, or, or something else, which happens occasionally. And the data for the categorization and the explicit reports is very similar. So I'm just going to show you what it looks like if you see how many people report having discovered these particular rules. OK, so what I'm showing you here is across these three different experiments, where in all three cases, one group was prompted to explain. And what varies is what happened with the other group, where they prompted to describe, to think aloud, or to engage in free study. And on the y-axis there, I'm showing how many of our participants, what proportion, discovered this, this foot rule. 
And what you can see is that across all three cases, first of all, discovery rates are relatively low. So less than half of our participants are discovering these. And that's in part because overwhelmingly they're discovering the more salient but less good role. They're discovering the, the body shape pattern, or they're discovering the pastel versus multicolor pattern, and so on. Um, but what you see is this pretty striking difference, a factor of two or three, in how likely participants are to discover this pattern, depending on whether or not we prompt them to respond. Right? And so one way to describe what's going on here is that when you prompt people to explain, they are not going to be satisfied with that salient pattern that has an obvious defect in having these arbitrary exceptions. Yes? What were the, the test subjects asked to explain? They were asked, so, so we'd ask them, for example, why, for, we'd point to a particular exemplar, like this particular drench, or I don't know if it's a drench or floor, but, but that particular robot, and we'd say, why, is, why do you think this one might be a drench? Or why do you think this flower is a dot? So they're explaining why a particular labeled example belongs to that particular labeled category. Okay. So they're not getting any more information than the people in the, in the control position. Everybody's getting that example with its corresponding category membership. The question is whether or not we're prompting them to explain all they do. Okay. Um, all right. So. I think this is this is a, a point for explanation. It looks like explanation is doing something pretty valuable here. Yes. Can you repeat or, or describe what the difference is between uh, asking the question? I think you ask a question in the in the, the experimental group. What do you do? What do you ask, or do you ask, or what do you, what in do you control, say for the other two groups? That's right. Okay. So for the explain condition, we'll say explain uh, why this one might be a event, and they write something. For the uh, describe control group, we would say, please describe this threat. Or we'd say, please think aloud as you study this robot, which is a dread. <laughs> um, or uh, they have free study where they have no particular instructions. They just have sort of time to study. So those were the three conditions in this experiment. And we've done other versions with other variants. The, the thing that, we, that our, our aim is in the control condition is we want it to be equally demanding. So we don't want it to be the case that we're just forcing people not to goof off versus letting them goof off. We want it to involve language because we want, our, we want to be able to isolate what is it that's going on when you're explaining specifically and not just when you're articulating things in language. And we also want to draw equal attention to the example of the category membership. So we'll typically try to repeat that in whatever the other prompt is. There was another hand in the back. Yes? Did you, did you play your experiment where you put all of the one category on one side of the screen and all of the other category on the other side of the screen? Yeah, so the question is if we tried it where we sort of visually separate the, all the dreads over here and all the glorps over here rather than scrambles the way I showed them to. And we have done it that way. Um, typically, you do get the same effects, but if you make the task easy enough that it doesn't require a lot of effort to discover the more subtle rule, then you do find that the people who are not in the explained condition can achieve ex explanation-like performance and it's easy. So it seems like it, has to, it matters that there be some effort required such that people who are not explaining are going to find a compelling alternative pattern and think, that looks pretty good, I'm done. And it's only the explainers who are going to say, I think there's something more here, I'm going to expend more effort trying to figure out what it is. Yes? Have you done uh, brain imaging during this? No. So, so the question is, we've done brain imaging during this task, and we haven't. Um, there's, there's starting to be some really interesting research using brain imaging to look at different kinds of learning mechanisms. And so I think we're getting to the point where it might be interesting to, to pursue that direction, but we haven't done that. All right. I'll keep going, but I should say, I'm especially happy to answer clarification questions as I go, because if you, if you miss something about what's going on, that might affect you later. And then I'm hoping to have plenty of time for this general discussion to it again. Yes? Is there a problem with um, having like big features versus small features, with small features are the uh, correct ones? So if you look across our, I've just shown you a couple of examples here. We've done this sort of task with lots of different kinds of objects and items. And the thing that matters, so big versus small, I don't think makes a difference. I think what does make a difference is something being kind of obvious versus subtle. And if the best 100% rule is obvious, everyone will discover it. Right? So where you start to tease apart the effects of whether or not you're explaining or just not, it's not something a little bit more subtle. So it does matter that it not just be kind of perceptually obvious, but I don't think size, at least within the range of sizes that we've looked at, I don't think size is a crucial variable. Um, okay. 
So I'm going to count this as a point in favor of explanation. Explanation seems to be doing something great here. It seems to be making people more likely to go beyond the, the obvious, the sort of first thing that pops out, the thing that's sort of the mere appearance that seems compelling, to look for something a little bit deeper and more subtle that might be going on in the world. And arguably, this is something that's really important in science. Right? A lot of what science does is take things that are perceptually similar or might have seemed like they should go together, and then think about more subtle ways of classifying things or finding shared properties that allow us to make more important kinds of claims and generalizations. So you know, just, just to illustrate this, right? Um, uh, if you just look at the sort of obvious stuff, you'd think the dolphin goes with the fish, but based on these more subtle kinds of properties, you might see actually the meaningful, more subtle uh, similarities would unite it with this other mammal over here, the elephant. And this also matters, I think, just in the course of everyday life, right? Even if we're not doing formal science, in the course of everyday life, we do a lot of figuring out what's going on in our environment, and this cartoon just illustrates um, you know, this, this, this mismatch between how people might look or act and how they're really feeling. And I think a lot of what we do, uh, as well as sort of informal scientists in our everyday lives, is figure out how to go beyond the obvious appearances to figure out what's really going on. Um, and so if explanation's playing a role in that, that suggests it's going to be extremely valuable in helping us to make sense of our world. Um, before moving on to some of the dangers of explanation, I want to show you another example that comes from kids. Um, because you might think this is the sort of thing that's especially important for young kids who are really full-time learners, trying to make sense of all sorts of aspects of their environment. Um, and we have lots of examples from different studies we've done in the lab, but I want to show you one that I think is a particularly nice demonstration of this idea that in the absence of explanation, we might be sometimes compelled to sort of go with the obvious or with appearances or something superficial, but that when you prompt kids to explain, you can get them to go beyond that and find more abstract or deeper kinds of relationships. And so the study I'm going to tell you about, we're done with my student, uh, Karen Walker, who's now a professor at UCSD. And the domain that we started to look at is kids' ability to extract the moral of the story. And part of the reason that this is an interesting domain is that we constantly use stories and storybooks as a way to communicate moral lessons to children. Uh, but if you look at the research that exists on this, it suggests that children don't really get those moral stories particularly well. Um, so one dramatic example of this comes from a study in which children watched a video about Clifford the Big Red Dog, and there's a three-legged dog who wants to play with him, and initially the dogs are very resistant to having a three-legged dog play with them because this dog is different and unfamiliar, um, and they come to learn that this dog is really just a dog like they are, and they all they play happily. Um, and so the intended lesson here is something about you know, overcoming social differences or superficial differences in order to appreciate sort of aspects of, of uh, relationships that perhaps matter more. Um, but if you ask children to tell you what the lesson of this story was, they will tell you that the lesson is to be kind to three-legged dogs. <laughs> so, um, they learned something, right? Um, but it seems like what they learned is very narrowly tied to the concrete particulars of what you showed them. Right? They seem to not be going beyond this one single example to appreciate the broader lesson that was intended. And so um, Karen and I thought, maybe if you can prompt kids to explain key aspects of a story as it unfolds, maybe this will help them move beyond the concrete particulars of this particular case and relate it to more general things that they know about the world and about relationships and so on in a way that will help them extract this more subtle, less obvious kind of moral of a story. So we constructed a bunch of storybooks. This is just one that was about, uh, you can't tell, but those people do have heads, so I'm not going to be real stupid. Um, uh, we we um, constructed a bunch of storybooks, and one of them was about uh, this uh, character named Jocko, who goes to the land of tall people, and he's just very short compared to all the tall people and the tall people. And so initially, in the middle of the story, he's excluded from playing with them, and he's very sad about this. Uh, but by the end, they let him play with him, and they realize that they can play together, and they're, they're, they can be peers. Um, <laughs> that's right, they're not playing basketball. I don't know what they were playing. I'm not sure what they were um, So what we did is that every child gets the same uh, storybooks to go through. Um, and what we do is that in the same way as we did before, we want half the, kid, half the participants to be more engaged in explanation than the other half. What we did is that we would stop the kids at two points in the story and either ask them to explain something that was going on in the story or give them a control prompt that was designed to draw attention to the same aspects of the story. So in this case, we call that the report condition. 
And what they did here, for example, is we wanted to draw attention to this point in the story, which is that Jocko sad, and so we say, remind me, was Jocko sad? You know, sort of saying, well, this is an important thing going on here, and they would give us a response. And at the end, uh, remind me, did the tall people decide to play with Jocko? In the explain condition, we just turned those same things into why questions. So they'd be asked, tell me, why was Jocko sad? And again, they'd provide an explanation. We would tell them if it was good or bad or right or wrong. Um, or tell me, why did the tall people decide to play with Jocko? And these points in the story were decided because they're the ones that should really help you extract something related to the moral of the story. What I think was especially interesting is that we also compared these two conditions to what we called a pedagogy condition, where the experimenter just told the kids what the lesson is, uh, what the answer is. So the, uh, here, the, the experimenter would say, Jocko was sad because the people in tall and black type were being different from them. And then you basically give them the lesson. The tall people decided to play with Jocko because it's OK to be friends with people who are different from you. That's sort of the more general lesson that we're hoping might extract. OK, so this is what they did as they went through the storybook. And the question for us is, is it the case that the kids who were prompted to explain are going to be more likely to extract this more abstract lesson? And so we assess that in a variety of ways, but I'll, just, I'll show you data for two of them. So one of them is we just ask them, the open response, what was the lesson of the story? And then we code what they tell us, or whether or not it was something that was actually a general lesson. And they didn't have to get you know, exactly the kind of wording we had in mind, but they had to get the general idea that this is something about it being uh, OK to bridge differences, OK to play with people who are different from you, uh, and so on. And what you can see here is that kids were most likely to produce this when they were prompted to explain, least likely in the report condition, and the pedagogy condition was in between. Um, and I think, most importantly, no better than the explanation condition, right? So there was clearly some benefit for kids having to generate this on their own rather than just having it handed to them. We also had a generalization task where we would give them another kind of real life scenario where you could apply this lesson to solve a problem and we'd see can they do that. And again, you see the same sorts of patterns where the kids who were prompted to explain were the most likely to do this, the kids who were in the report condition were least likely. And for the pedagogy, it always fell in between on a bunch of other measures as well. And I think the key thing there is it was not better than explanation, right? So prompting the kids to do this cognitive work themselves was even more effective than just handing them uh, the answer we were looking for. What age were these kids? Oh, excellent question. Um, Five-year-olds for sure. Now I'm trying to remember if we had four and five or five and six. I think it might have been five and six-year-olds. Let me see if I have it in my notes. No, OK. Well, I'll say five with confidence. Um, and we didn't find big age differences. Good question, though. OK. All right. Um, so I've given you some, some evidence that we can use this kind of experimental approach to find differences between what, what happens when you're actively engaged in explanation versus when you're not. Um, and of course, a natural further question to ask now is why, right? Why is it that when you're engaged in explanation, you see these kinds of effects on learning and discovery? And I think there's actually several reasons why you find these effects. And one of them is illustrated by the exercise that Mariel started us off with, the illusion of explanatory depth. So one thing that can happen when you explain is you realize that you thought you knew something and you really didn't. Uh, and that's an important first step in, in coming to some better uh, uh, set of beliefs. Um, but the other, the other thing that I think happens, which is important that we focus on in my research, is that when you're looking for an explanation, you're looking for something that will be a satisfying explanation. You're not just looking for any kind of random structure at all. You're looking for the kind of structure that's going to support a satisfying explanation. Um, so one way to think about this is just with the observation that when it comes to explanation, we're really picky. Right? We don't think all explanations are equally good. We don't like explanations that seem really complicated, that are narrow in the sense that they only apply to the specific thing we're trying to explain and don't generalize to any other kinds of contexts, or that really clash with our prior beliefs. On the other hand, there are some explanations that we really do like. Uh, we like explanations that are simple. We like explanations that are broad in the sense that they apply very broadly to lots of cases. Um, and that are consistent with our prior beliefs. Um, and for the most part, you see these ideas about what makes a good explanation echoed across a lot of domains. So you see this in history of science and philosophy of science. You see scientists uh, um, endorsing this as well. Right? So here's, here's one example of many that I could have chosen to make this point. Um, but this is Einstein talking about what it is that uh, is the goal of theorizing. And he says that the supreme goal of all theory is to make the irreducible basic elements as simple and as few as possible. So we get some notion of simplicity there. 
without having to surrender the added representation of a single data of experience. So we get some notion there of breadth or scope in terms of what our explanation is applying to. And what I think is going on in the cases that I've shown you has to do with the interaction between a somewhat complex world and a somewhat simple mind, or at least a mind that has a preference for relatively simple, broad kinds of structure. I think we have a preference for certain kinds of explanations. When we're engaged in explanation, we try to find things in the world that are going to satisfy those explanatory preferences. And that means that if something seems overly complicated or has lots of exceptions and we don't understand why those exceptions are there, we keep looking to see if we can do better and try to find some sort of simpler underlying generalization. And in a lot of cases, this will serve us really, really well. So when the world, in fact, has real, relatively simple general patterns to offer us, explanation might be really beneficial. And in the laboratory context I've shown you so far, there, there were those kinds of simple patterns to be found. But the prediction here is that this isn't always going to be the case. Sometimes the world really is complex and messy and has exceptions. And so one thing that you might expect is that it's not always going to be beneficial to engage in this kind of explanatory process. There's going to be cases where trying to fit in this messy, complex world into our preferred explanatory schemas might lead us to errors. And so here's where we get to um, a sort of uh, uh, minus point for explanation <laughs> comes down. Um, that explanation might sometimes encourage us to seek patterns even when they aren't there to be found. So the idea that we might be uh, inclined to find patterns where there are not patterns, I think, is a relatively common idea that comes up in lots of domains. And one of them is the cognitive science of religion. Um, so there's an influential idea that um, comes from uh, Stuart Guthrie, who has a book called Spaces in the Clouds. Uh, and the idea is that one of the reasons why you might see so many um, characteristics of religious belief across so many cultures involving things like agency, whether it's in the form of God or ghosts or spirits and so on, is because we tend to find the most meaningful interpretation we can for what some of the time is likely to be noise. Right? So the faces in the clouds analogy here I think is helpful. These particular arrangements of clouds are probably just random. There's nothing meaningful about the fact they happen to look like a face some of the time. Um, but it might be a feature of human psychology that when we find something which is in fact noise but looks a whole lot like signal, we might think, you know, this really is meaningful. There really is signal here. Um, the way this has been applied in the cognitive science of religion is with the idea that we might be uh, especially tuned to detect agents in our environment, other sorts of intentional creatures or beings, mm -hmm. even when they're not there. And so that might lead us to think that there are things like ghosts or spirits and so on, even in cases where there are not. Um, one, one way this idea has been described is this patternicity, is a term that Michael Shermer uses, but the idea comes up in lots of different cases. And so the idea here is that if explanation is something that makes us look for simple and broad patterns, maybe it's going to heighten this to some extent and make us keep looking for patterns even when there are no patterns to be found. Um, and speculatively, this could be part of what drives certain kinds of superstitious behavior, is trying to explain why it is that you might see certain kinds of events occur. Um, perhaps the real explanation is that it's a coincidence or that it was just by chance, but that's not a very satisfying explanation. Right? A satisfying explanation is one that finds some sort of simple, broad causal structure underlying all of this. Um, and so some superstitious beliefs could be an error of over-explaining when there was really no good explanation to be had. So again, how would you study this in the lab, right? So we want to take this idea and try to bring it into this more well-controlled laboratory environment where we can see if this is what we find. And so um, these are studies that I did with my PhD student, um, Joseph Williams. And we did a couple different studies, which I'll walk you through briefly. So in one of them, we introduced people to these two kinds of cars, Daxes and Kezes. Here are some examples of Daxes. They have these properties. Here are some examples of Kezes. There were, in fact, I think, five or six examples of each of these. Um, and again, like the other examples I showed you, there's lots of features here. So there's lots of things that could be going on in learning to classify Daxes and Kezes. I'll make this a little bit easier for you by just telling you that those three features you can completely ignore. Um, they were irrelevant in the sense that they were not at all diagnostic of category membership. And so really the structure that we built in here was that you could just memorize that the blue one is a Dax, and the cyan one is a Kez, and the silver one is a Dax, and the magenta one is a Kez. No pattern at all. Just basically learning these properties of the individuals. Or you could try to find a pattern. And we did build these in so that there was a pattern. So if you'll notice on this side, we have heavily insulated, made in Norway, and has treads all going together. Those are all the same features, but they all have to do with cold weather. 
versus made in Africa, used on safaris, lightly insulated. Again, they're all the same features, but they all have to do with warm weather. So the way that these were constructed is that each of these items had one of these theme features from sort of the cold theme or the warm theme. That's the pattern that we put in there for people to potentially discover. These idiosyncratic color features, which would allow you to classify these perfectly, it's just that there's no pattern to it. Um, and these irrelevant features, which again are irrelevant in the sense that they are not diagnostic of category membership. And what we did is that we put people in one of two worlds. We put them in the nice world where you could actually use the themes to, to classify accurately, or we put them in the uh, misleading world where we would randomly swap two of those features. <laughs> So if you're in that unreliable world, the misleading world, if you use the pattern to classify, you're going to be making mistakes. And in fact, the best way to accomplish this task is to give up on looking for a satisfying pattern and just memorize that the silver one is over here and the maroon one is over there and so on. So, so let me just walk you through what the task looked like. Uh, people would be introduced to what they had to do. Um, in this particular experiment, what we contrasted was explaining with thinking aloud as a control condition. Um, in the training block, people would get one of these items. They would have to say whether it's a DAX or a KEZ. At the beginning of the experiment, they would have no idea. They would just be guessing. But they would get feedback. So for example, no, that was actually a DAX. They would then see the item again with its correct classification for seven seconds. And during those seven seconds is when they would get the prompt. Uh, please try to explain why this one's a DAX. Or think aloud as you study this one to the DAX. So like, learn to classify this one as a DAX. And um, they would do this for each of the items. Um, and when they done it for each of the items, they considered that one block. And they would keep doing this for up to 15 blocks or until they could classify all 10 of them correctly. Um, so if you're using the theme here, in the nice world, that would work great and you could classify all 10. In the misleading world, uh, two out of every 10 trials, you'd be given the feedback. No, that's not working. Okay, so the question is, how is explanation going to help or hinder people in this world? So let me walk you through the predictions. That's just a little, uh, okay. So in the reliable condition where you could use the theme to classify, this is a nice, well-behaved world, you could, there were two ways that you could basically perform this task well. You could just memorize all those color features and you'd get 10 out of 10 right, or you can learn the theme and you'd get 10 out of 10 right. And so here we think explanation might actually be beneficial because it's going to help you find this pattern. And it's probably easier to learn and apply the pattern than it is to just memorize these 10 idiosyncratic color combinations. But in the misleading condition, the only way to get 10 out of 10 is to rely on color. And you have to resist your tendency to rely on the theme or find some alternative theme. And so here we predict that explanation is actually going to hinder learning and that people are going to do better in the condition where they're just thinking aloud. And that's what we found. So here, what I'm showing you is learning time measured the number of blocks of training that people had to go through before they got 10 out of 10 right. And in the case where the theme was reliable, there was a trend for the explainers to learn more quickly. So here, this is, because this is learning time, lower is better. It means you learn faster. And when the pattern was misleading, we found a significant switch in the other direction where the participants were prompted to explain are now doing significantly less well. And I think one of the reasons this is kind of a cool finding is because it helps rule out a bunch of alternative explanations about what explanation is doing. If you thought explanation just made you pay more attention, care more about doing well, pay more attention to the feedback, or something like that, they should be doing better there too. But they're not, they're doing systematically worse. Um, we then wanted to replicate this in a different domain just to make sure this is relatively robust. And so we had a task where people were, were studying these profiles about individuals, and they were trying to figure out how to predict who is likely to give to charities or not give to charities. And again, the category structure was similar, where we have um, these unique features, like you could just memorize that Anna uh, does tend to donate to charities, and that, sorry, rarely donates to charities, and that Janet frequently donates, and so on. So you could just memorize these idiosyncratic properties of the individuals. Yes? Uh, and uh, where, the, where, where the explanation would, wouldn't work, do you still give them a, what do you say for the explanation? We still give them the prompt. So we still say, you know, why do you think, like for this one, for example. Give them the same prompt. So, so you know, why so do you think this one belongs in this category? The, the prompt that you give them really doesn't help them. Um, because if, if they try to think of it and they realize it doesn't work. Well, they could. So they always have the option of saying, you know, why is this in a DAX? Because it's silver. They can always say that. Well, that the would be is, the, the rote. 
That's, that's right. right. That's, that's right. right. That's, that's right. right. But wouldn't that account for that difference between those groups? So let me, I think there's a version of what you're saying which is completely compatible with the way that I think about it. So let me, let me say it back to you. And if it's not, then let me know. So part of what I think is going on here is that when people are looking for an explanation, they want it to be a satisfying explanation. And that means that saying this one's a DAX because it's silver, where as far as you're concerned, that is totally arbitrary, and you know nothing about why silver should be related to DAXness, that's a really unsatisfying explanation. So even though it's what the structure of the data are pointing you to, and what your feedback is pointing you to, you're going to resist saying that's why, because it doesn't seem like a good explanation. And so you're going to perseverate in looking for some kind of a pattern or a better explanation. And that's going to make you more likely to then discover pattern features when they're there to be found, but also fail to settle for things when they're not there. So I, I don't know if you agree. I, if, if the way I described it, is that that's consistent with the way you're thinking about it? I think yes, and that's part of what's driving our phenomenon. Well, it, I, I guess I would see it more as given the choice, mm -hmm. if it were, if, if the higher choice would be the explanation. But if it doesn't work, the, the higher choice would be rote. Right, right. And what we see is that people who are prompted to explain are very reluctant to just go rote. And we also have evidence that it's not just because we are prompting them. So in other studies, um, with kids in particular, regardless of how we prompt them, we can just see how much are kids spontaneously explaining. And we find that their own spontaneous explanation has the same kinds of consequences. Or we can do studies where afterwards we ask adults, to, to what extent were you, were you explaining? And the extent to which they, they report what they were explaining also has the same consequences. So I think that suggests it's not just about the experiment of prompting them to explain, it's really about just engaging in that activity, whatever leads you to engage in that activity, that then has these downstream consequences for learning. Um, okay, so just to remind you, same basic idea, this is just a replication in a different domain. So what we do here is people are predicting who gives charities or not. Um, we have tempting patterns here related to age and related to personality, whether it's more extroverted or introverted. But in the misleading world, we swap two of these features so that the pattern isn't perfect. Um, in the nice world, you can use these patterns to classify. And I should say, we, we change across participants, whether it's younger people or older people who give to charities, whether it's extroverted or introverted, right? So there's nothing special about the particular way things are um, set up on this, this slide. And we find the same thing. So in this case, what we were looking at was not how long it took them to uh, classify perfectly. We're just looking at how many errors do they make in classification. And you see the exact same pattern, where when they're in the nice world where these patterns work, prompting people to explain has no cost. In fact, it makes them a little bit faster. Uh, as to sort of a little bit more accurate in this case. But in the case where we put them in this sort of mean world where the patterns are kind of misleading and that doesn't allow you to classify perfectly, we see the reverse trend where explaining actually makes you make more mistakes because you are basically overgeneralizing the patterns that are there um, and for separating and looking for patterns rather than just sort of settling for a kind of unsatisfying structure. So one example of a real world case of something like this might be something like a conspiracy theory. And I, I, I should say, um, this is speculation because I do not have experimental data to back this up. Uh, but if you look at the structure of a lot of conspiracy theories, what they involve are a lot of different sort of facts or events where in fact you might just think it's a coincidence that things unfolded that way or that things are independently caused and there were lots of different independent causes. But what a conspiracy theory does is say, actually, all of these things can be explained by appeal to this one agent or a group of people with a particular intention. And so it sort of takes something which would be a pretty unsatisfying explanation because it would be very complex and involves some elements of chance and replaces it with something which is satisfying in the sense that it might be simpler and broader and so on. So again, speculation, but it could be that, that some conspiracy theories are an error of over-explaining. Um, one case which is not speculation comes from um, some studies, some classic studies that were done looking at jury decision making. Um, and so here what these studies suggest is that if you change how easy it is for people to put something into a compelling narrative, that actually can affect their verdicts and whether or not they want to convict. So um, what they did in these studies is that they took transcripts from actual trials and they would give those transcripts to participants, but they would give it to them in one of two orders. One of them was what they called the witness order, and that would be just the order in which the witnesses happened to be called in that trial. 
uh, so, you know, whoever was called first, whoever was called second, whoever was called third, and so on, and they would read the transcripts of what these witnesses said related to this crime. For half the participants, they put it in what they called story order. And all they did here is take the exact same testimony, but reorder it to follow the chronological development of whatever was happening. So if, if, if you know, one witness was talking about seeing the uh, defendant at 10.15 a.m., and then at 10.20 somebody heard something next door, and at uh, 11.30 somebody called the police, and so on, right? Um, so same information, but what they were trying to manipulate here is how easy is it to put this into a compelling causal story? And what they found is that they manipulated independently whether the prosecution's uh, story was in witness order or story order, and whether the defense's was in witness, story or, uh, witness order or story order. And they found that this had a significant effect on how mock jurors responded in this case, where they were basically more likely to make a judgment in line with the particular side when that side was in story order. Right? So they were more likely to say guilty if the prosecution was in story order, more likely to say not guilty if the defense was in story order. Um, and so this, again, might be a kind of error of explaining, even if in a lot of contexts it's very beneficial to engage in explanation and evaluate how well we can explain things. This is a context where it seems like maybe you're just manipulating that sort of explanatory sense uh, in a way that might lead to really suboptimal decisions, because all you're changing here is how easy it was for people to appreciate what the story was. And it's having this, this, this you know, very consequential uh, effect in terms of the legal system. Okay, so just to zoom out again, um, I wanted to start with the human uh, drive to explain um, and say a little bit about how we can use the tools of psychology and cognitive science to try to get some insight into why it is we're so motivated to explain and what explanation does for us. Um, and I think there's really two sides to this, because I think our explanatory tendencies are part of what explain our remarkable success as a species, our great intelligence, our ability to engage in activities like science that allow us to go beyond the obvious and discover amazing underlying structure in the world. Um, but at the same time, um, these explanatory tendencies might be responsible for some cases of suboptimal decision making and some of our human failings, and in particular, a tendency to sort of find signal and noise, right? To look for patterns, even where there are no patterns uh, to be had. So if I haven't convinced you of all of this, um, I hope to have at least convinced you of the value of approaching these questions empirically and thinking about how we can use the tools of cognitive science to address them. Um, and I'm very happy to take your questions. Yes. Obviously, there are many different categories of explanation. There's the kind of clustering that a lot of your, your um, experiments went through. There's a lot of influence. There's the kind of mechanical explanation that we had at the beginning explain how mechanical works. Have you kind of, uh, um, do the results kind of span all of those? OK, so it's a question. Um, has to do about different kinds of explanations and whether we see the same results across the whole range. We've explored some of that space, but not all of it. Um, so what I do know is that we have varied the extent to which explanations are causally meaningful or not. So the examples that I showed you were all pretty arbitrary combinations between features and classifications. You know, for example, why should the pointiness of feet be relevant to being one type of robot or another type of robot? We have done versions where we make those meaningfully related to the category membership. So for example, if you know that they're indoor robots versus outdoor robots, you now have all sorts of prior knowledge that might like to think about why it is pointiness might be relevant to the function of this robot. And we do find two things. First of all, the results do generalize to those kinds of contexts. And also that we find evidence in those cases that when you're explaining, you are trying to make sense of things in light of your prior beliefs. And so you find a bigger influence to your prior beliefs when you're explaining than when you're not explaining. Um, in other lines of research, we've looked at other kinds of explanations, um, but not using exactly these kinds of experimental um, setups. So we have documented um, uh, differences between sort of more mechanistic kinds of explanations, like you alluded to, but we've also done a lot of work on what are called teleological or functional explanations, where you talk about the function or goal of something. Um, and we've also looked at what are called sometimes formal or categorical explanations, and that's where you see something like, uh, why is that round? Because it's a tire. Why does that have four legs? Because it's a dog. Um, and we do find that these different kinds of explanations have unique profiles in terms of what they suggest about the way you're thinking about that domain. Uh, and that translates into the kinds of inferences that you're willing to draw, into the way that you're thinking about causal relationships. Um, we also find that you can move around which kinds of explanations people prefer by putting them in contexts where one kind of explanation is more or less useful than another context in terms of the kind of judgment they have to make. So I think there's a lot of reason to think uh, 
that it'll be valuable and important to look at the different kinds of explanations, but at least no data coming out of my lab or any other research I know to suggest that if you then plug those explanations into this type of task, you'd get, you'd get real differences. Yes? Could you explain one more time when the jurors more called somebody guilty? Was it when the, story, when the uh, prosecution was telling a story or more in a witness order? Right, so the question was about the Pennington and Hasey study, where they manipulated the witness order or the story <laughs> order. So the condition that led to the most guilty verdicts overall was when the prosecution had their, day, their testimony in story order and the defense had theirs in witness order. That's the most extreme case because you sort of get the benefits of a good explanation for the prosecution and you don't get those benefits for the defense. The case where you get the least guilty verdicts would be the reverse of that, where the defense is in story order and the prosecution is in witness order. The defense is in story. Gotcha. Yeah, and then the other two cases are intermediate <coughs> because they're each sort of going in the, the, the Things are going in different directions. I mean, yeah, I'm processing yeah, witness. Yeah. Yes. yes, sorry. I was wondering if, if the uh, witnesses are inconsistent, is that still true or does it reverse? Oh, that's a good question. So the question is about what happens if the witnesses are inconsistent. Yeah. So as far as I know, there has been research on how people deal with inconsistency, especially from the, from the same person. You know, if one person gives inconsistent testimony over time. But as far as I know, no one has looked at that question simultaneously with the question of how the story uh, manipulation works. Um, what you do find when people are giving consistent testimony is that people do seem to be sensitive to how well calibrated somebody is. So for example, if someone says they're extremely confident about everything, but you have to be wrong about half of it, you're going to trust them a little bit less than if they say they were really confident about one thing and not so confident in another thing. I think that's be wrong. So there's reasons that people are very sensitive to that, I think. I was um, just wondering if the story is uh, um, sequential, but a, a confusing, mm -hmm. people would be less likely to go by that. Yeah, I and mean, I can tell you what the, what, what the general theory says um, <laughs> is that what people are doing, and this is called the story model of jury decision making, and it's developed by the same authors, Pennington and Hasty. The idea is that what a juror is doing is not weighing every piece of evidence that comes in in the courtroom in isolation and judging their beliefs. So what they're doing is taking all of the pieces that they get and trying to put them together into some kind of a coherent narrative. And the more coherent that narrative is, the more likely they are to make a judgment that aligns with whatever that narrative is pointing to. And so inconsistency would certainly be something that would make you have a less coherent narrative. It's kind of the, the equivalent of the the confusing uh, the order. That's right. That's right. That's right. And, and they do have other studies where they try to manipulate other things other than the story order and just show that if you kind of make it a better narrative in some sense, that people are more likely to go along with that view. Part of what's so dramatic about the, the example I showed you is that um, everybody gets the same evidence. Whereas a lot of these other manipulations, if you try to manipulate consistency, you're now looking at groups that are getting different evidence. So part of the reason I find this one so compelling is that everybody gets the same evidence. And you still find this difference. <laughs> yes? Is there a way to um, kind of distance oneself from this explanatory bias? So if you're briefed beforehand that you might be more likely to do something mm -hmm. when you know it's an incoherent story than just give it a text, for example, does that change the way right. you perceive? Good question. So the question is whether or not there are ways to sort of de-bias yourself so that you don't fall prey to these kinds of uh, traps. I don't know of any research that addresses the kinds of traps I talked about directly, but there's a couple of, of lessons you might draw from, from research. So I think one thing is that, uh, and I think as a scientist I feel like I face this a lot, is that you have to remind yourself Sometimes the world doesn't support your elegant, beautiful theory. <laughs> as much as I would have liked the results to go one way because my, the theory would have been beautiful, you know, tough luck. That's sometimes the world's not that way. So I do think it's helpful to have that attitude where um, just recognizing that some of the time things are not going to support satisfying explanations. Um, one thing that we do know is that one, one other kind of explanatory bias that exists is that if people explain why some particular outcome might come about, they tend to think it's more likely. So for example, if you have people uh, before an election 
uh, explain why you think the Democrat might win, or explain why you think the Republican might win. And then you have the messaging, how likely do you think it is the Democrat will win? How likely do you think it is the Republican will win? You find that the people who you prompted to explain inflate their estimates for what they explained. Right? So the people who explain why a Democrat might win are going to give a higher estimate for Democrat winning than are the ones who explain why a Republican might win. And in that case, specifically, we do know that a pretty effective way to debias yourself is to explicitly engage in the project of explaining the opposite. So if you find yourself thinking, um, oh, why is, why is my friend going to love this gift? Is this a good gift for my friend? Why would my friend love this gift? You should then also ask yourself, why would my friend not like this gift? <laughs> right? Um, and I think in general there's good evidence that that kind of consider the opposite of what you're assuming is a pretty good tool. So that might be one that you can apply broadly. Um, but I think that there's just a lot we don't know about these specific cases. Why um, do you think there are so many uh, religious people when the narrative is not very coherent? <laughs> All right. All right. An easy question. <laughs> so the question is, why are there so many religious people when the narrative is not very coherent? Uh, so I think there are lots of factors, and I won't speculate about most of them, but let me tell you about one strand of them. So, so one common idea, especially in kind of the earlier anthropology of religion, was that one of the reasons that people are so drawn to religious belief and why religions have the characteristics they do is because they provide good explanations to the natural world. And I think a more common contemporary criticism of that is to say, really, if you look carefully, they raise at least as many mysteries as they resolve. Right? And so maybe that's not what's going on. What I would say to that critique is one of the things that they might do is replace mysteries that we really care about with mysteries that we don't care about so much. Um, so we have some data from my lab where we find that for factual questions like why is rust red, if you give people the answer, it's a mystery. They say, no, that's not okay. <laughs> you can't, that is, that is not an acceptable answer to why is rust red. But if you give them religious questions like, why is there evil in the world, given that God is good? And you look at people who, who believe that, right? So we're looking at people who believe that as strongly as they believe that Russ is red. And for that question, you say, uh, it's a mystery. They say, okay, or at least they're willing to accept that. Um, so I think there's something different about our tolerance for mysteries and the ineffable and unexplainability, at least for a lot of people in the religious domain, and we're just trying to try to figure out what that is. Um, so I think, I think there's just a lot of interesting stuff packed into your question. And, uh, I can say more, but it would be drawing more on, on other people's speculation about religion. Um, there's a question here for a just, I just want to comment briefly on that Einstein citation. That <clears throat> it looks impressive, but in the context, I think it's counterproductive. Hmm. Uh, the reason for that is there was a statement he made in 1934. In that time, he was working on a paper that he, Podolsky, and Rosen published in 1935, objecting to <coughs> the standard explanations given by quantum mechanics because they involved um, entanglement, which Einstein rejected as spooky act action at distance. Well, entanglement not only became accepted, but now it's assumed in a basic principle for quantum computers. So you pick the section where Einstein was the wrong uh, side of the Oh, I see. Yeah, that's interesting. I should look at that context, and that's really valuable to know. I mean, I do think my own view is that these explanatory preferences are definitely not guaranteed to point us in the right directions. No. So some of the time they might lead us to the right view, some of the time they might lead us to the wrong view, but I think I, the point is well taken. I should look, I look at the context for exactly how I understand what's using that. Thank you. Um, question here, then there, and there. <laughs> this is a little far afield, but um, we've been studying history for thousands of years, I'm trying to understand, uh, trying to understand things. So, are we getting wiser? Are we getting any wiser? And why, or why not? <laughs> Can you repeat the question? The question is, if we're getting wiser, and in particular, given that we've been studying history for thousands of years, um, are we getting wiser? I, I would so like to say yes, and I don't have any good basis for backing that up. <laughs> I'm going to take that as a, as a useful prompt to think more, because I don't think I have a wise response for it. Do, do you have a great word answer to it? Um, I asked a history professor. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, he laughed, and then he said, well, maybe some people are getting wiser. Um, <laughs> so maybe some people are getting wiser. And I think in the case of science, 
it, it, it's clear to me that we want to make the claim that science has progressed and that we've had real scientific progress. Right? Um, and you know, we still think most of what we know is probably wrong, so we have to be careful about what we mean by progress. But that's a case where I think it's a, it's a clear success story, um, where you can tell some story about cumulative learning and discovery. There was a question around the middle and in the back. Yes. Um, so, okay, so I'm a grad student in philosophy and physics, and have gotten kind of captured by a lot of philosophy of science stuff more generally, and very interested in uh, kind of looking at this uh, boundary where uh, that we cross when radical skepticism kind of prompts us to start giving up our like hard ontological commitments and our uh, beliefs and our models. Um, and then I, I talked to philosophers and physicists, and there's this diversion to the skeptical perspective a lot of the time, or at least like a more radically skeptical perspective, um, which is understandable, I mean, uh, for you know, a lot of reasons. Um, you know, in, in part because, you know, by kind of unraveling our narratives, uh, we don't have as much to talk about, and you can imagine why that would horrify a philosopher. But, um, <laughs> but you know, they're, they're also very big, pragmatic, you know, our models, are, our scientific models are very useful. Um, and so there's certainly a big pragmatic benefit uh, to having them and working with them. And I'm, just, I'm curious if, do you know any research that's kind of explored how we can still um, kind of harness the, uh, the pragmatic benefits of, of narrative around things like scientific models or whatever? while still kind of keeping in the foreground uh, a, a skeptical perspective or a questioning perspective or recognizing the nature of, of these narratives as narratives. Yeah, that's, 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 so, so the short version of the question, which I'm repeating for the benefit of the microphone, is if there's a way that you can get these benefits that come from explanations or narratives, while at the same time being mindful about the fact that there might be a way in which there's kind of a fiction, um, and that we're just operating with working models that we, we have reason not to think really capture nature of the choice and so on. So that's a fair short version. Um, there was one aspect of that that I thought about that I think is interesting. Um, and the way we've gotten to this is by thinking about a process that philosophers call the inference of the best explanation, and which a lot of you might have heard of even outside of philosophy because it's kind of an intuitive idea. So this is uh, you know, sort of what Sherlock Holmes does when he gets a bunch of evidence. He claims it's deduction, but it's almost never deduction. It's almost inference of the best explanation. He says, here's all the evidence. What would best explain that evidence? Well, it must be that this person did it this way for these reasons and so on. Um, and I think we engage in this kind of process all the time. And so one thing that I've been interested in and that epistemologists have been as well is well, is it the case that the things that strike us as better explanations are actually more likely to be true? Are we warranted in making that inference? And I think there's really good reason to be skeptical of that. Um, and so one thing that we've been exploring, because the data has taken us there, is towards the process that I and a philosopher named Daniel Wilkenfeld have called explaining for the best inference. And the key difference there is that the idea is that we might engage in explanation, not because the explanations we're producing right now actually accurately describe the world, but because engaging in this practice of explaining might have positive consequences in terms of what we learn and discover. And we have evidence that matches that. So to give you one example, um, for a lot of the studies that we've done with kids where we prompt them to explain, this is actually not, not for the one I showed you, which is encoded this way, but for a lot of others, what we can do is, for the kids, we have the kids who are prompted to explain, and we have the kids who are not prompted to explain. We can look at the kids who are prompted to explain and say, well, how many of them gave the right explanation? Now, it turns out the ones who gave the right explanation tend to show the best performance later <clears throat> relative to the other groups. But even the kids who gave the wrong explanation do better than the control group. So something about explaining, even when you got it wrong, seems to have positive consequences. And so we tried to explore well, what is it that's going on there. And I think there's a few things going on, but I'll just mention two of them. One of them is some of the time articulating a bad explanation helps you appreciate that it's bad. And that's some of what you saw, perhaps, with the illusion of explanatory depth that Mariel led you through. So part of it could be that. Another part of it is that I think when you're searching for an explanation, part of what you're doing is thinking about how to re-represent the space of possibilities. So if you think about the, the pointy versus flat feet for the glorps versus dress, to get to pointy versus flat, you have to move away from triangle, L-shaped, T-shaped, and so on. And so I think one of the things that happens when you're explaining is you're a bit more flexible about the way you're thinking about representing things in that domain. 
And I think the, the recognizing where you're wrong and the being flexible about your representation in a domain are both things that can have positive downstream consequences, even if they don't get you there right away. And if that's right, what's interesting is that you don't need to, to I don't think you need to keep in the foreground that uh, you know, our models are fiction, and this is just an idealization. These might just be things that fall out of human learning when we engage in explanation. Um, so it answers part of your question, but that's sort of my, my best bet is like maybe we're, maybe this is actually in fact part of why science can be so successful without scientists being paralyzed by examining ontological commitments, right? For the most part, it's the philosophers of science who worry about this stuff. And for the most part, the scientists just go about their work without worrying about this. And I think this might be part of the reason why is that they can get away with it because they get some of the positive downstream consequences even when some of these substances are wrong. Yeah. Yes. Have you done any work about um, when people or your uh, subjects give wrong explanations and then you show them the right explanation, uh, what it takes for them to switch over and, and agree with the with a good explanation about changing yeah. changing views. Yeah, so the question is if we've done anything where we basically see what it takes to get someone to move from the, the wrong explanation to the right explanation. And for the most part, in my lab, we haven't. Um, part of the reason that we haven't is because um, the thing that fascinates me so much about explanation is that you can see these learning consequences even when it doesn't lead to new information. Right? You're just explaining to yourself in your head, and this is changing information processing. You're thinking of a context, which I think is a really, really important one when you think about pedagogical contexts or politics or lots of other contexts. Which is, okay, well, what about when you're now confronted with feedback on your explanation um, or a better explanation? When do you change your views? Um, and then you talk about one study which wasn't done by me. It was the lead author was someone named Phil Fernbach. But he actually used this phenomenon named the, the illusion of central death. And they did this for political cases. So they did things like, um, uh, you know, what's your attitude towards the fiscal cliff? This was done a few years ago. The, the fiscal cliff. This is when the fiscal cliff. Fiscal, thank you, fiscal cliff. This was in the news a few years ago when they did this. Or what's your attitude towards this particular you know, way of taxing carbon emissions and things like this? And people would have opinions about this. And then you would say, oh, OK, can you explain the fiscal cliff to me, please? <laughs> can you explain how this method for taxing carbon emissions works? And when you do that, you get this illusion of explanatory depth. People try to explain it. They realize, actually, I don't entirely get how this taxation system is supposed to work. I don't really get how the budget uh, you know, deficit works and so on. And what was really intriguing is that after that, they tended to express more moderate political views on these issues. So it seems like going through this process of recognizing, being forced to confront your ignorance about something, actually made people more receptive than they might have otherwise been. Um, and that's especially dramatic in light of lots and lots and lots of other findings in psychology that suggest that if you just give people evidence or arguments, they kind of walk into their views rather than being persuaded. So the fact that first starting with something like the IOED that made them say, you know, I really don't entirely get this, that seems to make them more receptive to evidence and they, they are in lots of other contexts. So that might be a promising There's a comment, Arlie Hoftow found the same uh, results when she you know, went to that county in Alabama where it was predominantly crop believers and, and she, people have asked her, you know, what did it take or what does it take to get these people to change their views? And she found that asking them to explain why they believe what they believe was the, gave the best chance of having them be able to change their views. Oh, thank you. I didn't know about the connection to that aspect of work. Thanks, that's good to know. Yes. Um, so you talked, uh, pretty much everything here is about, it was answering the question, why? Did you look at any of the other W words, like how or what? Because it's a subtle but very yeah. definite difference when you're thinking about explaining something or coming up with, with what's going on here, what exactly is happening, right. and, or how is it happening, because it's a different Yes. I, so the question is about different WH questions you can ask. What, when, you can ask how, not WH, but an important one. Um, I think that's a, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. So we focus on why questions for a variety of reasons, um, in part because I think they're the ones that typically uh, are the ones that we go to when we want a sense of understanding and the story, and that's part of what motivates my interest in this. But I think those are definitely important. Um, and you can ask very similar questions. So, yeah. Good cover of research. Um, here? Yeah. Uh, 
That's not a question, but I would like to make a comment since uh, religion was brought up by two or three questions. It depends on what religion one is talking about. My background is in Hinduism and Buddhism. It begins with great skepticism at the very start. I'm quoting the hymn of creation uh, from the Rig Veda. And the, the last four, last stanza is, whence this creation has arisen, perhaps it formed itself, or perhaps not. The one who looks down on it in the highest heaven, only he knows. And the last sentences are, perhaps he knows not. <laughs> so much for skepticism, and this goes back to 5000 uh, BC. How do we know it's 5000 BC? A close friend of mine, who is a computer scientist and a Sanskrit scholar, quoted the poet you know, who, is, who wrote this, saying I'm sitting by the side of this river and the constellation is such and such, and he used the concept of precession of the earth to figure out when this particular uh, uh, stanza was composed. And that goes back to 3000 BC. Anyway, is there a comprehensive explanation which uh, came out of, uh, out of this <coughs> worldview? Yes, there is. And it is something, the storytelling which the Hindus and the Buddhists uh, practice practically every day. Mm -hmm. There is called Namaste. Mm -hmm. What it means is, I know that you are the intelligence of the whole universe. And now you're assuming this name. And I recognize you that this is just your temporary name. Mm -hmm. And the other person says Namaste also. And they bow down towards each other that it is the great intelligence playing a game, in a narrative in which the, all of the parts are played by the same intelligence, which is the Brahma. And he is. <clears throat> He or whatever that you know, the gender you want to, you want to give to that power, likes to have the <coughs> pleasure of playing the role of everybody. So it's, it's a narrative in which the director, the actors, and the <coughs> and the scenes are all the supreme intelligence of the universe. <coughs> So this is the whole explanation which satisfies Hindus entirely and it also explains that why there is so much <coughs> uh, animals eating other animals, humans consuming animals and all this. It is it has nothing to do with the, uh, it's enjoyment of the in, <coughs> intelligence that pervades the entire universe. Oh. So a, if this sounds totally weird to you, <laughs> let me add, add this. I did my PhD in psychology also, uh. experimental social psychology at Stanford <laughs> many years ago, and I worked as a counseling psychologist for many years. Maybe I can Does that okay. explain why Atman is born? And yes, correct. Right. So Atman is a word. Uh, in German, Atman, Atman yeah. means to breathe. So when the breath is gone, yeah. then uh, you're gone. Yeah. Yeah. So Brahma, then you become one with the Brahma. So let me, oh, instead of repeating that, I'll share an anecdote which captures the very first part of what you said, which I think is a really important point. Um, I've been to a lot of conferences with, with anthropologists of religion. Um, and that, that's not my own expertise, but it's literature sometimes. And what's great about having anthropologists of religion in the audience is that for any generalization anybody makes about religion, they, they, they will say, well, actually, this group over here doesn't do that. And, you know, and this set of religious beliefs in this other place doesn't have that property. And so I, I, it's a point well taken that I think one has to be very cautious in generalizing across religions and religious beliefs because there's a huge amount of heterogeneity, um, including with respect to the topics that we've talked about. Do we have five more?
Can we pick that one part on this thing? Okay. 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 Let me see if we have time. So we can come up with a question here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, all right. Just a question about the the educational power of explanations it is quite profound. Has that been? Filtered into has that been applied in formal educational systems, whether it's at school boards or in textbooks? Yes. So the question is: Has this been applied in educational context? So the short answer is yes. So this is, this is known as the self-explanation effect in the education literature, and the ways that it's been implemented are that sometimes teachers will prompt their students to engage in explanation, and this is a strategy that they're sometimes given in reading textbooks. The other place you see it where it's not necessarily done intentionally, but is in the form of peer tutoring. So there's some really fascinating studies that find that sometimes the tutor learns more than the two teeth <laughs> um, uh, in those kinds of contexts. And so I think a lot of things that have already already baked into a lot of educational practices capitalize on this effect whether or not they recognize it. I would also caution that, as my studies show, it's not always beneficial. And so I think one thing that hasn't adequately been recognized is when it might perhaps lead learners astray. So for example, if you don't have enough prior knowledge to really represent some particular mathematical concept or to understand how natural selection works, explaining where all you're doing is reinforcing your misconceptions could be bad. Um, so I think there's some nuance to how it has to be applied, but it is definitely recognized as, as one tool in educational law. So I think this might be the last question based on time. Well, actually, that one question mm -hmm. covered my head. Oh, that's great. I mean, that was what I was very close to. Oh, well, one final question? We have one short one. All right, short one. Um, considering that um, that we used to think that light goes in a straight line, and when, when Albert Einstein said it doesn't, it will bend, has one of your wrong explanation ever opened up a new avenue of thinking? Oh, interesting. One, one of my own personally, or do I think this is the case that? So you maybe you personally, or you have heard of one. Okay, and I think this probably happens all the time, actually. And I think one thing that's important to think about in the scientific community is that you can have scientific progress even when it's not within one person's mind. Right? So I think it can actually be really beneficial in the scientific community for someone to articulate a really compelling wrong view. Because if they do so clearly enough, it allows other people to test it well and to move away from it. Right? So I think there's a lot of value, and this is actually I think one of the reasons why it's often valuable to formalize our theories, is because when you're forced to be really precise about it, you can be really clear about what's going to count as evidence against it. Um, and you can invite other people in the community to, to, to consider alternatives. Um, so at the level of community, definitely. At the level of individuals, I think sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.